Well, welcome back. Uh, we're back in the Word in Ephesians. So um, as we press on here, we are in this next section of Ephesians where Paul is taking uh, the blessings of the church and what he's explained about those blessings, and now he's going to apply it to our lives. Uh, any good Bible teacher, any good pastor uh, gets to the application. What does this mean? What is the so what? Why does he do that? Because the Lord expects that his people will act differently in the world. He expects that they will act in accordance with the truth of the Bible instead of what they see going on around them. That's what he expects them to do, and even to the point of suffering for that. In fact, look at what Jesus suffered for us in order to carry out the will of God. So that's what we see here is God's call to us to live differently in light of what we know, even if it costs us. We see the principle here uh, in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, again, is uh, summing up or bringing an application from what came before. It's applying it, uh, saying, okay, for because of what I've told you before, do this. What I've told you before, be imitators of God as beloved children. So that's what we're called to do here. This is our call, and we're called to, uh, I've titled this chapter, Live the Truth. Verses five, chapters five and six are living the blessing. So we see the principle here, and in verses three through 14, kind of a long chapter here uh, that ends with a, um, could have been a um, early hymn of the church says, but when anything is exposed by the light, in verse uh, 13, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible in light is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, or arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Uh, this is um, um, kind of summing up what he's saying here, is that we need to live in the light. And what does he mean by that? We need to live uh, a life of purity. Uh, a life of holiness. And by holiness, I don't mean that we need to be kind of ascetics or that we need to be um, um, have these affectations of monks <laughs> uh, walking around uh, with our eyes closed in prayer all the time. Holiness simply means this, being set apart for God, setting apart your life, your energy, your th mind, your emotions, your will, your time, setting them apart, making them available for God, putting them to putting those resources you, He's given you to work in the work that He's given you to do. One of the things He mentions here is sexual immorality. He mentions it in chapters in verses three and five. Let me read that. He says, "But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you." Verse 5, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Hard words there, uh, direct words. Sexual immorality is a um, grievous thing to God. Uh, we saw in the book of Romans in chapter 1, it seems to be the pinnacle of man's rebellion against God. Uh, seems to be homosexuality uh, in both sexes. Um, uh, a step along that way is immorality. Um, uh, that would be adultery in marriage. That would be sex outside of marriage. That would be sex with underage people. Um, all kinds of uh, sexual immorality are included in his. Other things, deception, as you read through this. Teaching or saying things that mislead. Sometimes deception can be blatant. Otherwise, it's just a delusion. We take God's word and we t turn it or pervert it or we emphasize one thing more than another and it becomes uh, something that uh, is not what God intended. That would be deception. Empty. That is devoid of truth, that it has no truth in it. When Paul, and I'm looking at verse 5 here, when Paul talks about these things, he's talking about covetousness, no inheritance, said, let no one deceive you in verse 6 with empty words. Because of these things, that is these sins, 
this impurity, uh, this deception because of these things. The wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. You know, um, I think he's talking about people who are in the church physically, but outside the church spiritually. These would be the uh, chaff among the wheat. These would be the false brothers and sisters who are in the body. Why do I say that? Because he warns them that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Uh, wrath is not intended for anyone in the church. When we get to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, you're going to see that the church is protected from God's wrath. It's those outside the church, those who are not true believers, who are going to be subject to the wrath of God. And that's what Paul's talking about here, is that... Um, these uh, immoral people, these uh, sexually immoral, these deceivers are uh, sons of disobedience. So he tells them in verse 15 to drop down there, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So Paul is urging caution on them. He's telling them to be careful, be careful individually, be careful as a body. After all, he's writing this to the church at Ephesus. And he's been writing all about the church. So he's telling the whole church here to be cautious. Don't be unwise. We could say, don't be foolish. But he says in verses 18 through 33, live in the spirit. And these are important verses here. He says in verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. And then he goes on to describe what that means how are you filled with the Spirit, brothers and sisters? By yielding to Him. Uh, we are too full of ourselves most of the time. Too full of our own intentions, our own plans, our own ideals, our own expectations. We need to empty ourselves of ourselves and yield ourselves to the work of the Spirit. And how do we know what the Spirit wants us to do? Through the Word. The Word tells us what the Spirit wants us to do. The Spirit illuminates it and helps us to see clearly in the Word. So what does the Spirit want us to do? Addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Primarily, He wants us to worship. That's what He's called us to do. He's called us to worship individually and corporately. It says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So not only does he want us to worship him, but he wants us to be grateful and thankful for him, continuously remembering all that he's done for us. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, having this mutual yielding to one another. And then Paul will go on to specify what this looks like in the very practicalities of life, wives to their husbands, Husbands to their wives, children to their parents in chapter 6. Very practical outworking. These are the things that the Spirit calls us to do. We don't need a special uh, voice in our head telling us this, or we don't need our heart being warmed and led in this direction. The Spirit is clearly telling us what He's called us to do and challenging us to do it. So, we're called here to live a wise life, not foolishly, but we must yield to the Spirit. And let's begin today. As you finish your reading today, take a few moments yourself to worship God. Perhaps sing a hymn to yourself. Uh, sing a hymn with someone, someone else that you're with or worship Him and thank Him then. Move on to thanksgiving for the what the Lord has done for you and then begin this uh, mutual submission, uh, deferring to one another, not insisting on your own way. Start in small things and it'll grow and grow. And in this way, brothers and sisters, you'll grow to be more like Christ, who worshiped the Father, who was thankful for, thanks, always gave thanksgiving to the Father, and also who is always obedient to the Father. So God bless you, brothers and sisters. And um, may you have the uh, power of the Spirit with you today to implement these things that he's called us to do.